book of 1 Timothy is a pastoral epistle written by Paul the Apostle. It's one of his final letters to his protege and spiritual son, a young pastor named Timothy. And although the letter is intended for his ministry life, the content transcends and applies to the Church of Jesus Christ. Within this letter is the most explicit and complete instructions for church leadership and administration. Not only is the Christian's character of utmost importance, but also the church's culture is of spiritual significance. From the qualifications of elders and deacons to the quality of the times and seasons, this letter teaches the believer to guard the truth of the gospel against spiritual treason. And that is why 1 Timothy is a perfect template to follow for life and ministry. Because when we submit to the inspiration and course correction of this letter, the church will be purer, her people bolder, and the gospel clearer. The book of 1 Timothy. Dear church, this is your charge. All right, so if we were going to be defined or described by our neighbors or even strangers, perhaps even if you were to define Landmark Church, how would you do it? What would this church be known for in the community? Would it be defined by, of course, our full worship experience, the talent of our musicians and our vocalists? Would that be what we're known for? How about, and I'm biased, our powerful preaching and proclaiming of God's word? Like, is that what would be said of Landmark Church? Wow, they preach the word of God. If you want to come for a strong healthy, sound message, come to our church. Is that the definition and description of yours truly? Would we be known for our fellowship? People are sweet, they're loving, they're kind. Would we be known for our special events, our sub-ministries, our target approach to the kids and the students and the young, like, what would we be known for? Now, would all those answers align with the Word of God? Now, of course, many of them would, but would this church be known and marked by what the early church was known for and marked by? Primarily, prayer. Would this body of believers be defined by prayer? Would we be those who don't need to be incited or prompted to pray. We have a lifestyle of prayer. But I'm not just talking about every Christian's personal responsibility to have a prayer life privately. I'm talking about what Paul writes to Timothy, which was supposed to address the church corporately. So what I'm going to lay before you today, the application is for you when you leave the building as an individual Christian, no doubt. But more importantly, the priority of prayer should happen corporately. Hey, guilty as charged that we can spend more time talking about our announcements and our ministries than committing the needs of the world and our families to prayer. Amen? Amen. This is what we are instructed into. In fact, this was the DNA of the early church. A few verses if you will, Acts chapter two, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That was the teaching. That was the revelation of what we call the Old Testament scriptures given to the apostles to find their bearing on the church in the first century before it was written down as we know it in the New Testament. It was the apostles' doctrine, their teaching and fellowship, it says, the gathering of the saints and in the breaking of bread. Okay, I like that part. There's communion there. There's There's fellowship there and in prayers. They were known for their praying. A few chapters later, Acts 6, verse 3 and 4, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. The needs involved widows, but other needs, family needs, prayer requests, and they were serving tables. And the apostles or the elders at the time They said, hey, find amongst us men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Evidence that their spiritual life is alive, active, vibrant. And they have wisdom to discern and make decisions. 
and appoint them over what is called tables. Deacons serve tables. Tables are a touch point. When the church has needs, there are those amongst us that rise up and meet the need. So what do you do all week, pastor? I do the next part, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now listen, thank you, sir. Thank you one person that appreciates what I do. God bless you. Listen, I understand ministry comes with plenty of needs, but I also understand my calling as a pastor in this context is to make sure that I'm prayed up privately so that I can come out here publicly and administer the word of God. But perhaps, as I've already said, I may have neglected prompting you, urging you, imploring you into corporate prayer. So I'll take responsibility for that. I will tell you moving forward, we are going to spend more time praying in this setting corporately together. We're going to be formed as we intercede in prayer because we have full access to the throne room of grace. Church, listen to me. If the church is to survive the upheaval of the world, she must take up the mantle of prayer and she must take seriously the ministry of the word of God. We must. It's now or never. Paul has already spent, as we know it, one chapter laying out his intentions for the letter, the epistle. He's charging young Timothy as his proxy in his stead to stand at the gate of the fellowship and protect or preserve the gospel because there were false teachers with false teachings that were coming from the church and corrupting those that were heeding those teachings. So here's what Paul does. In light of chapter one, we get a therefore in chapter two. Therefore, which really is just a hinge to get you to go backwards in chapter one. Therefore, in light of everything in chapter one, therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Stop. Right away, verse one allows us an outline. If you're taking notes, we're going to discover the call to prayer. We will also touch on the cause for prayer. And in this one verse, we see the various characters of prayer. There are various forms of prayer. What's the call to prayer? Well, he says, I exhort, first of all, underline first of all, or at least note, first of all is not number one on a list that is long. Check number one off, move to the next. That's not first of all here, even though it sounds like that. Hey, first of all, it's basically above all. This first of all is a priority over all. So I like to look at it as it's not just an item on a list. Prayer is not just an item on a list. Prayer is the list that holds the items. Like prayer supports. If you have a notepad and you're writing down different things you have to accomplish during the day, I got number one done, check. I move on to number two, check. We often treat prayer that way, right? Prayer, check. Now move on to number two, check. No, God is saying, I want prayer to support the entire list. That does not mean that the church does nothing but pray. It simply means, look at me, that the church does nothing without praying. So we pray. Why do we pray? Well, I remind you of the two themes that are running like two strong rivers that make up the body of doctrine and the duty for the church and the Christian. That's what the entire epistle is built upon. If I may remind you of those two themes, the first, that truth would be preserved in the church. The church is the pillar and the ground of truth. If the church does not preserve truth, you better believe our world is in a terrible state, worse than it would be if the church was not the pillar and the buttress of truth. If the church preserves truth, then those in the church will persevere in the truth. We will allow truth to persevere in us and we'll continue to endure in the truth. That's the cause for prayer. Why do we pray? To protect the church from lies. To ask God to provide to the church what we need 
to fulfill our mission while on earth. The call to prayer, there's an urgency. The calls for prayer, the entire book of 1 Timothy. Now the character of prayer. The character of prayer as you see it, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. These are different types of praying. We're gonna define them, but I guess I have a question before we move on. I'll say to myself, as I'm saying it to you, why don't we pray more? If we know what the scriptures tell us about prayer, why don't we pray more? There's really only two answers to that question. We don't pray more probably because, if we're being honest, we don't actually believe in the power of prayer. We're not praying as much as we should because we don't really believe that God is going to answer us. Or, if it's not, I don't believe in the power of prayer, it's I don't need the power of prayer. Oh, this one. Here's the indictment. That the church and every Christian can be guilty of doing life on our own strength. I have the ability and the capability to provide my own needs. If I don't need God, then I'm not going to communicate and pray to him. But here's where we go wrong. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we are truly connected to the vine and the vine gives us life, then we should be a church that prays. Where do we begin? We begin with the posture of prayerfulness. What's the posture of prayerfulness. You ready for it? Helplessness. Prayerfulness begins with helplessness. And I don't say helplessness in the sense of something that's pathetic. I say helplessness as it should describe the church with how we're dependent upon our God. We're not hopeless. We should be helpless though. We can't accomplish anything without the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but Proverbs 4.13, or excuse me, Philippians 4.13, pastor, I can do all things. Finish the verse. Through Christ, ready? Who gives me his strength, who infuses me with his strength. That verse is actually said like this. I could do nothing without his strength. See, our posture of inadequacy should cause us to depend on, on his sufficiency. Our recognition of our impotence, we have no power, should cause us to trust even more in his omnipotence. He has all power. Now, again, as I say this, I'm asking you to make the application to your own life personally, but also at the same time, know that I'm teaching to the church corporately. And I'm asking each of us to raise the level of prayer in this fellowship. How do we do that? Supplications, he says. What is supplications? Defined heartfelt requests. Deep felt needs. Anybody have any deep felt needs in their life? Do you think this church has deep felt needs? Yes. Therefore, we are to, and here's my sticky definition for supplications. We are to supply our needs to heaven so that heaven can supply our needs. There you have it. You supply your needs to heaven so that heaven can supply your needs. That's supplications. Prayers. This is a religious term. It means communion and communication with God. Now we're talking about prayer, but in the midst of this list, the character of prayer, you have supplications, you have intercession, and you have thanksgiving, but now you have prayer. This is like praying without ceasing. As you go to and from, like Paul tells the church in Thessalonica, pray without ceasing. The posture of communion and communication with God. And I can tell you the weeks or the days that I stay in prayer, where my mind is stayed on heaven, I'm more peaceable, I'm clearer, I'm more confident, I'm more joyful, but the days that I am cut off from that connection with the Lord and I'm not prayerful, I become a complainer, I become bitter, I become resentful, I become sour. Amen, church. I wanna skip intercession and have it roll over to Thanksgiving, and here's why. When Paul writes to the church in Philippi, he says this, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your 
felt needs, your requests, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard the places in your, your life where stress and worry and anxiety are often lodged, the heart and mind. But if I'm prayerful and I'm anxious for nothing because I'm presenting my felt needs, supplication, with thanksgiving, because anything less than thanksgiving and prayer is nothing but a complaint. You know what I'm talking about? Right? Like the dad rushed out of church, got into his car with his family, wanted to make their way to the restaurant. Glad we're out of there. Sermon went way too long, he said. Began complaining at the traffic light. Come on, want to get to the restaurant, he said. Eventually, got through the light, hit more traffic pulling into the restaurant. There he is, frustrated, complaining. Eventually, was about to pull into a parking spot. Somebody beat him there. He let that person know he wasn't pleased. Eventually, got inside. They ordered their food. They sat down. He grabbed his family's hands and said, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the meal. Thank you for today. Amen. His little son said, Dad, does God hear you pray? Well, of course he hears me pray. Does he hear us when we don't pray? The son said. The dad said, well, sure he does. So he heard you in the car on the way over here, Dad? <laughs> well, yes. And he just heard you pray over the meal? Well, yeah. Okay. Which one does God believe? Ouch, right? If you can't say amen, say ouch. Which one does God believe, right? Because it's easy to complain our way through life and then stop and actually say prayers that we don't really believe. Because here's why, the translation or the transition from your prayer life is going to be manifested in your public life. Intercessions, what are intercessions? The best way to understand intercessions, one, intercessions is praying on behalf of someone else. But also, it's the idea behind petitioning or petitions. Everybody in this room has probably signed a petition. And petitions have different causes. So think with me, if you will. A petition comes across my desk. It states the cause. Why am I putting my signature on the petition before submission? It's either opposing something or supporting something. Most petitions are built upon that premise. You're either opposing something or you're supporting something. So you're willing to put your signature, your endorsement on the paper and submit. That's kind of what intercession is. You're going to the Lord and you are either petitioning something that you know he opposes and you're just interceding on behalf of your family, of your marriage, of a ministry, of a church, of a country, or you're interceding and praying for something that God supports, asking for his will to be done. Is this making sense? And I think it's the lost ministry of the church, intercession, going before God. They have said, and I've heard it taught, and again, I've agreed, but I began to read the verse after Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Ephesians 6 is the buildup of the armor of God. We all know that, right? Why do we put on the armor of God? Because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the very spiritual, wicked enemy behind the veil. And you could probably see the manifestation of what's happening in the spiritual, in the physical these days. The veil between heaven and hell is thinning. And you're beginning to see these things unfold around our world. And the Bible's like, hey, put on the armor of God. Make sure that you have every piece of the equipment. You understand the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Make sure you put on the helmet of salvation. Don't forget to shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Get up that shield, lift it high because the devil is firing fiery darts at your soul, at your heart, at your mind, and you need to extinguish them. But know the word, church, because it's the sword of the spirit. And they say it's the only offensive weapon in the list. And I go, no, it's not. Because verse 18 is connected to the armor of God. Yes, the word is a weapon, and I go on the offense, but here's another weapon for the offensive. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer 
and supplication. There's that word again, in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer is an offensive weapon, praying for the saints, praying for the church, going before God, petitioning and proposing and asking for his will to be done, his kingdom to come. The physical example of this in the Old Testament is Esther. And we covered the book of Esther not too long ago. Esther, this Jewish queen to the king, King Ahasuerus. At the time, the background or the plot line was a man named Haman. And Haman wanted to destroy the Jews. And Haman spearheaded a decree that you better believed caused anti-Semitic fervor to sweep across the known world at the time. And as God placed Esther in a position to intercede physically on behalf of her people, the time came in Esther chapter five, prompted by Mordecai, her uncle, Esther 5 and Esther 7 tell you how it unfolds. If she was to go before the king and he was not pleased with her, it could lead to her execution, the loss of her life. Everybody knew that. The king must summon you. So she was willing, in the passage, she said, if I perish, I perish. In other words, I'm willing to put my life on the line in order to intercede on behalf of my people. Well, that day came and the king saw her, and I guarantee her heart was beating fast, and he did the symbol of acceptance by lifting up his scepter. And in that moment, Esther was granted the audience of the king. Now, what's that got to do with us? Oh, it's a beautiful picture, physically, of the access that we have with our king spiritually, because Isaiah says that Jesus, the Messiah, is a scepter of righteousness. And when he was lifted up on that cross, he paved a way, he made a way for anyone to come into the throne room of grace and make petition and intercede on behalf of their family's needs or their church family's needs or for their people, the saints from all across the world. I think it's interesting that even now, we are witnessing anti-Semitic attitudes, which always is in tandem with anti-Christian sentiment. When you understand history, those two go together. And I wanna be like Esther, who goes before our king, according to Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I know this church needs more grace and more mercy from our God to help in time of need. Families in the midst of this church need more grace and more mercy in our times of need. And there are many of us in this church that are gonna intercede on behalf of other families. And there are many of us in this room that need to intercede on behalf of our families. But corporately, the church is supposed to intercede on behalf of God's people. I could show you verse after verse about the importance of praying for Jerusalem, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, praying for the chosen nation of God. Now, that does not give a blank endorsement to the secular, godless state of Israel. But when you understand Bible prophecy, when you understand what God has to say, that he is eventually gonna use what's happening in our world to save his own, as he uses the church to usher in the gospel, people hear that Jesus is who he said he was, and God uses the church in the midst of it all to save more Jews and more Gentiles. That's the posture, but we must intercede on behalf of those that are currently suffering. Now, that's just not for the Jews, that's also for the Palestinians. The church prays for what moves God's heart, like Casper Ten Boom did. Anybody know Casper Ten Boom? That was the father of Corey and Betsy Ten Boom. They're the more known ten booms. When you read about Casper, the head of his home, you discover a man who took God at his word. In fact, he adopted a prayer life from his father who had prayed for the Jews even before they were given back their land. Casper was alive during World War II. In fact, in 1940, the Nazis occupied Holland. Casper was a Dutch 
watchmaker, a watchmaker. He had attentive eyes to detail and he saw that something was brewing around him and he would intercede on behalf of the Jews at the time because he understood where it was all headed. And there's a story that goes like this, a clergyman, a pastor that the family was asking to take a mother and her baby out of town for safety. And the pastor did not want to put himself in harm's way. Likely used Romans 13 as the reason why he was supposed to submit to the governing authorities. As he was making that very clear, Casper walked into the doorway, didn't say a word, grabbed the baby from the mom. He said his long gray white beard brushing up against the cute little baby's face. And then he said these words, you say we could lose our lives for this child. I would consider that the greatest honor that could come to my family. And he lived out what he said he was about. He not only, and here's why there's a connection here. If you're interceding on behalf of people in private, it's only natural for you to live a life that intercedes on behalf of people in public. That men are willing to take a stand for righteousness because we're taking a stand in private for righteousness. That's how this plays out. Or like Abraham, how about like Esther praying for her people? How about Abraham praying for people that weren't his people, but he used his people as a means for God to save other people? That's Genesis 18. The entire chapter, Abraham is asking God to not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Ladies and gentlemen, if God does, and you've heard this, if God does not deal with America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. And yet Abraham's like, would you spare the land, the wicked, if there are righteous amongst them? Do you understand the importance of being the righteousness of God in Christ? As the bride of Christ is the righteousness of her groom, Jesus? That our God would be willing to spare the land? He'd be willing to spare the wicked because we're taking him at his word? Would you save some if there were 50, 45 righteous, 40, 30? 20? He got down to 10. And you know the account. There wasn't even 10. Which begs the question, is there any righteous amongst us? Ezekiel said there wasn't. Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 30 and 31. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. And here's God but I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. That's sad that God looked out on a land and could not find one man or one woman who were willing to make a wall. That's intercessory language. To stand in the gap and the walls of our land, figuratively, are broken down. Families are broken down. Marriages are broken down. And God is looking for a man or a woman to take him at his word and to stand in the gap and intercede. So make this next quote yours to influence the blank. You fill in the blank. You know what you need to pray for. To influence, I'll say, the land for God, you must intercede with God for the land. Fill in the blank. To influence your family for God for generations to come. Grandparents for grandchildren. Parents for children. Children for friends. To influence your marriage for God. The men and women, husbands and wives, you must intercede with God for your marriage. Not just individually, corporately here. Listen, hear my heart when I say this. The person that takes this position cannot do everything. People can come up to us with ideas. Hey, pastor, great idea I have, all outlined, great. And they expect me to implement it. 
And I'm saying this church is gonna create space for you to use your gift. And if God is prompting you and inciting you and stirring you to lead a prayer group, we're gonna make that happen. If you wanna come out early before a Thursday night service, which we already do, and fill our prayer room up and intercede on behalf of your marriages and our land, we'll make that happen. But each of us needs to pick up the mantle of prayer on our own. This is the challenge. This is the charge for each of us. Because verse two is the target audience. And this is where it lands. All types of prayer for all types of people. But specifically, look what Paul writes Timothy. For kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Translation, instead of grumbling about our government, complaining about those in power, the verse commands us to begin praying for those in power. Do not be like the man who was pulled over by the police officer. And the police officer said, sir, license and registration. And the man shot back very quickly. You people need to get organized. Yesterday, you took away my driver's license and today you wanna see it? Which one is it? Now listen, I get it. Yesterday, the government and those in authority may have taken away our license, our license to be free, our license to be Christian. They've taken away our liberties slowly but surely. Tomorrow, they might give them back. Either or, it tells us we pray for those appointed to authority. Why do we pray? How do we pray? We need to understand the need for why we pray. Romans 13 verses one through four, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists the ordinance of God and those who resist, resist the ordinance of God and bring judgment upon themselves for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Complement that verse with what Peter wrote. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance for man, of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Now, don't miss this. The entire purpose of government from the local to the national level is to sustain order and good and restrain and restrict evil and disorder. That's why God says they're my ministers. And you're not supposed to just pray for your church ministers you are supposed to pray for your political ministers. And it's as if the church has completely lost the purpose of intercessory prayer on behalf of our land. It's because we're told that the word politics is a curse word in the church and don't bring it up from the pulpit. Meanwhile, Paul writes to Timothy that the highest form of prayer is to kings and those that are appointed to authority. Peter reiterates that thought. Now, Make sure you understand the footnote here. Both Paul and Peter were both executed by the very government that they're mentioning in these passages. Both of them lost their life for not submitting to the governments, which begs the interpretation that we are to be loyal to government until government is disloyal to God, okay? That means civil authorities are appointed by God and require submission not period, I add a semicolon after that statement. Why a semicolon? What is a semicolon? Any English majors in here? A semicolon is a period and a comma. It's like a statement is made, but there's more to extrapolate. So yes, we submit to government, semicolon, because we do not submit to a government that forbades us to do what God commands us. Let me say that again. You don't submit to anything that forbids you to do what God commands you, nor do you submit to a government that wants you to do something that God forbids. Are you understanding this? Okay, 
We don't have time to talk about Daniel 3, Daniel 6. We don't have time to talk about the disciples saying, we're gonna obey God rather than man. The point of me touching on this is because we are called to submit to government as long as government, as God's minister, is sustaining good and restraining evil. The moment they say you can't pray, you pray. The moment they say you can't speak Jesus or the gospel, you speak Jesus, you preach the gospel. You do not allow them to determine what God has already said to his church. Interestingly, Romans 13 was the passage in the scriptures that allowed countries to begin to name their leaders in high positions, prime ministers. You ever wonder where a prime minister came from? I'd argue that several positions of authority can be called prime ministers. Judges are prime ministers. Governors are prime ministers. Mayors of a community is a prime minister in the midst of a context. The president is a prime minister. Now, some countries have prime ministers. Canada has a prime minister. Australia has a prime minister. Israel has a prime minister. And the aforementioned need to be prayed for. Prime prayers for prime ministers. Not to mention the miracle that happened recently in what we call the House of Representatives. And if you don't know your current events, I will help you. There were four individuals that were previously nominated to become the next speaker of the house. And of course, I've spoken to enough people where it looked like the house was in shambles, and it is. There's great division there. God has been removed out of our government. There's a spiritual battle that is raging and waging for the souls of men, and you're in the midst of it all, and the church has decided to be silent and be sidelined, and God's like, no, engage in the battle. Intercede on behalf of your land. And of course, there were people praying for somebody. I didn't even know who he was until last week, and his name is Mike Johnson. And out of all the people on the Republican side, God would raise up one as if he was hiding him in the wings and eventually comes out of nowhere. And when you do your research about Mike Johnson, he is a godly, born again with a biblical worldview man who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, is unashamed of the gospel and is willing to stand in the gap. And here's what that means for us. You better believe the opposite side that stands for the opposite of God. They're going to be attacking this man and persecuting this man. And this man now more than ever is going to need a church that intercedes on behalf of what God wants to do through him. Okay. You can go to ifapray.org. If you're wondering where I get some of my intel from, intercessories for America, pray.org. Ifapray.org. Interestingly, his first speech, you got to watch it. You got to watch Mike Johnson's acceptance speech. He not only says, my wife can't be here because, you know, she's, She was praying while all this was happening, like, this is a man who is going to do the next righteous thing. And who knows what that means? All I know is that God is able to raise up and remove any leader at any given time. And here's why you pray. Write this down. It's not why, W-H-Y. How do I remember to pray? And why am I praying? Why? It's W-H-I. Write it down. It's an acronym. Why am I praying for leaders? because they need wisdom, W. They need wisdom from heaven to make determinations and decisions. They need humility, H. They need to be humble and recognize God has them there, whether they realize it or not. And they need to have integrity. That's why, W-H-I, integrity to make decisions. So we are to pray for the authorities appointed by God that their administrative rule would point to God. And here's why. How they rule affects your life. These decisions that are coming down affect your marriage, your family. Like Jeremiah told the captives in Babylon, seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. How do we do that? Pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. In the midst of that peace, you'll have peace. Now, verse two, there's a hinge. Pray for kings and those appointed to authority. Okay, why? Verse two that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Twofold. More you pray and trust God as sovereign, like Daniel chapter two, he raises up kings, he disposes kings. The more you come out of that prayer confident, peaceable, actually quiet in spirit. Confident that he's got it and you don't have to worry about it. And yeah, I know what the news report says. I see the trajectory we're on, but I have the roadmap. 
I know how it plays out. I know the end game. And that allows me to have peace and quietness of life while at the same time living in godliness and dignity, reverence. Now, let me kind of add to this verse that we may lead a quiet, parentheses, that's outward. Quiet life outward, when things are quiet. Things are not quiet right now. And peaceable, that's inward. Living godly, that's Godward. Reverence and dignity, that's manward. Outward, inward, Godward, manward. Point, that political peace would allow for Christians not just to be at peace, but to advance the gospel of peace. I will tell you the truth, it's easier to be a Christian in a less hostile environment. God will use hostility and persecution, but that's not preferred. It's easier to talk about Jesus in your workplace when you're not being persecuted by your coworkers. Now, a sermon for another time is how we get comfortable and complacent when things are easy. But God is like, if you pray for your government, those in authority, mind you, it was Nero, a tyrant of tyrants, a bloodthirsty murderer who eventually killed Christians for fun and eventually beheaded the apostle Paul. But to pray for the peace of where you live is to allow the gospel of peace to go forward easier. Long story short, as an inmate of the state, trying to preach and teach the word of God in an environment that was otherwise ungodly and oppressive. And a lot of the times the confusion that was stirred up in the midst of an environment came from the, you ready for it? Our government, corrections officers. And the harder they made the environment for the inmate, the more they stirred up uneasiness, the harder it became for me to share my faith. But the moment we prayed, true story, for the officers that were overseeing our housing unit, and they began to treat us like humans and not animals, you began to see quietness come upon a housing unit so that the Bible study can actually happen, so that people can hear the word of God proclaimed and then come ask questions. And that's exactly how it unfolded. And I'm going, that's a microcosm of how it should play out on a larger scale. So we pray for our mayor, we pray for our governor, we pray for our president, we pray for prime ministers, we pray and we might not have access to them, we might not be able to speak to those in authority about God, but the scripture tells us we can speak to God about those in authority. And in the words of Billy Graham, to get nations back on their feet, we must first get down on our knees. Why? If it goes well for the leaders of our country and they make good decisions, our life goes better. When laws are passed that are sound and just, our families are safer. When church leaders make godly and spirit-filled decisions, your souls are in better hands. When your boss or your manager makes wise choices, the company grows, your job is secure. It's a no-brainer. You pray for those who are in positions of authority. Now, as we come to a close, and here's the why, and I'm going to tap back into this vein next Sunday. Here's the why, verse three and four. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our savior. What? Yeah, it might not be good or understood in the sight of man, but this is good in the sight of God. He desires all men to be saved. Why are we praying for these people? I don't agree with them. I wouldn't stand shoulder to shoulder with them. I don't agree with their policies or their politics, but God cares for their soul. And he has a desire to save all men. That's not just a New Testament principle. That's an Old Testament principle. Isaiah 45, verses 21 and 22. And there is no other God besides me, a just God and a savior. You ever saw that word in the Old Testament? a savior. There is none beside me. Look to me, he said, and be saved. All you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Here's the point. There is only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We pray for the salvation of all men, horizontal. We pray for all men at the highest level, vertical. God desires all men to be saved and that's not up to you. But you can recognize not all men desire to be saved, but you don't know who they are, so you pray. I like what this commentator said. God is willing to save all, though he does not will to save all. He desires the salvation of all, but did not decree the salvation of all. Nonetheless, our prayers should be as extensive as God demands, all men. Our hearts should be as expansive as God desires. Would salvation fall 
upon even our enemies as Jesus commanded us to pray? Would we end where we began? If the church is to survive the upheaval of the world, she must take up the mantle of prayer and the ministry of the word. Where does it start? It starts with recognizing our human weakness. Prayerfulness begins with helplessness. To influence your marriage, your family, this country, for God, you must intercede with God for the country. You must be commissioned to pray prime prayers for prime ministers. Dear church, this is your charge. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it by God's grace. Let's do it. Let me pray. Father, your word has been proclaimed. Your people have been stirred. We lift up all prayers for all men, intercession, supplication, and thanksgiving. We trust you for the outcome. Use us to that end. In the name of Jesus, we speak that name over our families, over our lives, over this church. Amen.